Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show. Episode number 75 of me, your host, Agostino. What's up, man? What the hell is up? I've got the microphone volume cranked up now because I think I listened to the previous episode and it sounded a bit low. So hopefully my booming baritone voice is loud and clear over your little radio earphones, podcast, streaming airways, man. How are you guys, man? How the fuck are you, man? Huh? I'm doing good, man. In case you're watching this on the video, I'm flexing my bloody bicep, man. I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good, huh? Look at my dab, huh? Look at my dab, look at my dab, man. Just came in from the gym, you know what I mean? Feeling good, feeling spicy. I came in from the gym, and guess what I'm drinking? Pre-workout, huh? No, I mean post-workout. Look what I'm drinking. Ha <laughs> ha! Some cerveza, motherfucker. It's Thursday, it's my day off. I'm making a podcast. Why not drink a, why not drink a little beer, huh? Why not drink a little cerveza? Why not drink some bubbly alcoholic beverages? It's not like I haven't been drinking for the most, for the last week and a half when I was in Primavera, huh? It's not like I've been doing that. Of course not. I've been just at home, you know, studying and reading the, the word of God, you know, and giving my time to charity, you know, and giving money to fucking homeless people at Liverpool City Station. Obviously, I haven't been doing that. I've obviously been doing the, the, the former, but hey, you know what? You know, you've only got one life. Um, I like to have a bit of a weird balance in my life, you know? I like to go out and exercise a lot. And I also like to go out and get fucked up a lot. I guess sometimes you just need to you just need to understand who you are and grow into that person little by little. But also understand that, you know, there can be things that you can do that can make you go down a really weird path. So um, as long as I keep myself in bounds and control myself and rein myself in, you know, sort of like a racehorse, you know, like chomping at the bit, you know, like a fucking racehorse, you know? Pull myself in. <laughs> as long as I pull myself in, right, I'll be fine. But yeah, man, I'm feeling good. Just came out from the gym, you know. Good little workout. Morning workouts are the best, aren't they? Especially when you did it fasting. I I fasted for like 18 hours to uh, what well, today or yesterday, whatever it means, whatever I concluded it. And it feels amazing working out like that. Usually, I never eat anyway before I go to work out. Um, before intermittent fasting, I would say my last meal might have been around six, seven o'clock, depending on what time I got home and depending on what state I got home. But now with um, this whole intermittent fasting thing, I use this app called Zero, by the way. Check it out by this um, hugely talented guy called Kevin Rose, who also does a lot of stuff with Tim Ferriss. So you probably might have heard his name some um, mentioned in other places. And he's also he used to be the founder of Dig. Um, that website everyone used to use back in the day, sort of like a, remember it was sort of like Reddit, uh, before Reddit was Reddit. But yeah, I've been using this app called Zero that, that helps you track um, how long you've been fasting. So essentially what you do is that you start it once you, what, you, you click start um, after your last meal and then you click start again um, and then, then you click finish when you eat again. So the goal is to kind of do 16 hours a day and it has a sort of like a, a little system, a little guide that you can use. So you can start off maybe at eight or 10, but now I'm trying to do 16 hours a day. And it's, I feel great, to be honest. I feel fucking amazing. My back was flaring up a little bit when I came out from Barcelona, which I'd assume had a lot to do with my diet not being what it should be, you know, because I, I haven't done anything weird. Um, the bed that I slept in the Barcelona Airbnb was quite comfortable. The bed that we have here at home is really, really nice as well. So I doubt it was anything to do with the bed I have here. But I think... You know, just the, the fuck up diet, the poor sleeping um, schedule and just the fact that I was drinking um, most of the time didn't really help the situation. So now since I've kind of re jigged my diet, I've come back and I'm sleeping now, I don't know, seven to eight hours a night. And I'm also intermittent fast since I've come back from a trip. I feel really good. You know, it's weird how that thing can happen. And so I guess for the most part. That's why the beer came out. I want to kind of reward myself for getting myself back on an even kill, which is, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit um, preemptive, you know. Um, I, did, I might have jumped the gun a little bit by rewarding myself with this little thing, but hey, what can you do? Two podcasts a week, man. That's a new wave, I think. Um, ramp it up a level because I've, I've been consistently putting out one, one a week, but, you know, there's no point of resting on your laurels. You might as well... Um, aim for the stars and maybe you land on the moon you know that old adage um so yeah this is what i'm doing man cranking it on as ever if you haven't 
Check that already on the description. Check me out on YouTube. I'm also uploading these videos on YouTube, so you can do all that subscribing and liking, all that malarkey on there. Um, but if you like to listen to an audio because you're at work and you don't want to see my ugly face staring at you, you're staring at you, then you're more than welcome to listen to the audio portion of the fucking podcast. But, you know, I'll be showing you lots of video chip, video clips, video chips. Imagine there's a video chip. Does that exist? Video chips. Hmm, probably not. But I'll be showing lots of video clips, right? And also talking about stuff that I like that I've seen during the week that I thought has been fucking amazing. So it might be a good idea for you to check out the video portion later. And I'm also uploading clips. I'm also clipping stuff on my YouTube channel and uploading clips about certain subjects I speak about that I think people might be interested in, such as the Primavera Festival that I reviewed. And also the Remoa and Off White luggage. You know, I kinda of went on a bit of a rant about hype beasts and about travelling and about, you know, um, doing marketing campaigns that really talk to the people and none of this bullshit about buying stuff and just having stuff in the, displayed in your corner of your apartment or whatever nonsense it may be. But anyway, enough about that. Let's roll right into the podcast. Before we do, as ever, this podcast is brought to you by Audible. To claim one free book credit as well as a 30 day free trial, visit the link below at audible.com for slash Aggie. That's audible.com for slash Aggie. You'll get one free book and a 30 day free trial if you click that link below. And you're obviously going to help me out because I, I read all the time. Look at all these fucking books, man. Books for days, you know? Look, Unbreakable Runner, another fucking book, you know? Books, 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 books. I got this. Do you remember that? Paolo Coelho, mate. The Alchemist, man. Fucking amazing book. I got this. The Beauty Myth, man. You know, because I want to understand what these fucking feminists are talking about. So I bought one of these, you know? I got this. Pablo Escobar, you know? It's my father, man. I got all the books. So if you click that link below, you're going to help me out. I'm going to be able to buy more books and more books. And I'm going to feel more smart, more, more, more smart. So yeah, click the link below and you can check out more of that stuff now. Anyway, roll, 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 roll your boat gently into the podcast. Let me talk about the things I've seen so we can get cracking. Oh my fucking God. So have you seen the stuff, the surgery, have you seen the, the fallout since um, Roman Jason's Liverpool uh, Champions League final? Of course you haven't because you don't probably care about football. Well, I'm here to fill you in. So Liverpool lost to Real Madrid, obviously, right, in the Champions League final um, a few weeks ago. And it's an interesting occasion because Liverpool, by and large, are a team that I absolutely loathe, right? Always a victim. It's never their fault, right? I fucking love Liverpool. Yet somehow this season, even though they fell, you know, they finished, I think, fourth in the league. They somehow managed to jammy their way all the way to the Champions League final, you know, through um, brilliant team play and through an individual star talent in Mo Salah who had an absolutely amazing season right he absolutely smashed it he scored i think maybe was it 37 goals or something stupid like that um double digits double digits assist and in most big games that liverpool needed him in he turned up and he delivered the goods but if you've been watching liverpool you would know that the worst thing about them or the, the thing that's probably the weakest in their side is the midfield and then probably the defense or maybe the defense then the midfield so as good as the front liners they have with Roberto Firmino, with Oxlade Chamberlain, with Mo Salah, with Sado Mane, and whoever else they put up there, they let in too many goals. But they've also had a real big issue with their goalkeepers. You know, they've been rotating between Carrius and Simon Mignolet, right? Who both of which haven't really pulled up any trees. Uh, Simon Mignolet was a player who um Jurgen Klopp from when he started at Liverpool kind of always earmarked to somebody he wasn't really fond of, right, since he's since he came to come into the club. And he pinned his hopes on this young keeper called Carriers, who necessarily hasn't really had a great start to Liverpool season ever, right? Or a Liverpool career. But if you look, go back into your memory bank, you'd remember that one David De Gea, um, the one people often say, you know, maybe one of the best keepers in the world, the best for Manchester United, had a pretty a uh, turbulent couple of seasons when he started for May 92. So turbulent that I remember Gary Neville uh, coming out quite strongly against him and saying that he didn't rate him and didn't think he was any good, right? Which is funny, uh, considering how amazing uh, De Gea is and considering how I think for the last three or four seasons he's been voted May United's best player of the season, which obviously says more about United than it says about De Gea, but hey, say la vie. So, Karius is, is a shaky goalkeeper. The defence isn't that great, even with the addition of uh, Virgil van Dijk. And the midfield is uh, average at best, and they've got a world-class front line. But playing against Real Madrid, you really need to have all your bases covered because Real Madrid have so much talent in their team. Plus, they have a rock-solid defense, a rock-solid, um, rock-solid defense with a pretty average goalkeeper. Right? I don't think um, 
any of their goalkeepers are any better than Karius or Millionaire. Eh? But for the most part, you'd say on paper that Liverpool were the firm underdogs in this game. But for some reason, the pundits or the spectators got roped into this rope of dope of thinking the game was going to be competitive. And for the most part, for the first 50 minutes, it really was a competitive game, right? Uh, it was nil-nil. Both teams were kind of going at it together. And you kind of felt as if, like, one moment of magic from either side was going to decide the game. But obviously, something happened previously that kind of put things into Real Madrid's favour when uh, Sergio Ramos fouled um, Mo Salah and Mo Salah dislocated his arm. Now, when, when it happened in real time, it didn't look like anything happened. You know, it didn't look like Ramos did anything um, on purpose. It looked like an innocuous challenge. Two players coming together, playing a Champions League final. One person lands awkwardly and unfortunately dislocated their shoulder. But then on, re on the replay, it sort of looks as if like Ramos hooks his arm into Mo Salah and kind of judo tosses him over, over his shoulder and he lands in awkward position and kind of dislocates his shoulder. Now, of course, Ramos denied he did it anything on purpose because, you know, he's not going to come out and say, I purposely tried to pull this guy down by his arm. But if you watch the replay and if you've seen Ramos play usually for Real Madrid, you'd see that he usually does pull um, on the blind side of the referee. Um, I know a few players do that. Pepe does it. Um, I know Cialini does it too. He's got this technique where they kind of pull from the blind side of the referee so they can kind of get their foot around the striker or the attacking player. So obviously Liverpool were um, at a huge disadvantage when Mo Salah had to go off because he was their star man in the team, right? But then they also went, had a huge advantage when Karras decided to um, not concentrate. He, his concentration dipped for one moment in the game, which allowed Romaju to get a, a lead. Um, he kind of tried to roll the ball out. It, it hit um, Karim Benzema and it rolled into the net. A pretty, pretty diabolical goal. But for the most part, you know, you can forgive him for that kind of mistake because keepers have made that mistake in the past. You know, I remember Ruth Van Lister and Paolo Di Canio scoring a couple of those kind of goals before where after, I don't know, an attack or something and the goalkeeper picks the ball up and he wants to do a counter-attack, in the hurry to a counter-attack and throw the ball out to his team, he doesn't look behind him. So sometimes a, a goalkeeper will roll the ball out in front of him in order to kick it without realising that there's a striker behind him. striker will come around and kick the ball into the empty net. Happens quite often. So you can excuse Karius for that mistake, right? You think, okay, shit happens. Then quite um, soon, five or six minutes later anyway, Saida Mane scores an equaliser. It's 1-1. So, you know, you're like, okay, everything's okay now. We're all back on, even, on, 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 on an even footing. But then this Karius guy dips in conversation again and Gareth Bale hits a sh an innocu innocuous shot. Innocuous. Like, he smashes it and Karius says, I don't know what he was thinking about. If he was thinking about um, the after party afterwards, if he was thinking about meeting up his girl, if he was thinking about having a joint, doing a line, buying some trainers. I don't know what he was thinking about, but his mind wasn't in the game. Bale shoots the ball incredibly hard. Karius is in the wrong position. His hands are here and his body's over there. So obviously, if you know anything about physics if you know anything about stopping uh, a high-powered ball coming towards your face, you'd, you'd imagine you'd need the mass of your body behind the ball in order to kind of diffuse it. But since his arms were to the side without anything stopping it, the ball kind of shot through his arms or into the goal. So effectively, he cost them the game. And the fucking backlash from it was crazy. He got absolutely pillared. You see Carriers crying on the fucking pitch in the floods of tears. And because I hate Liverpool, I'm actually going to get it up here on the image, right? Carriers crying. He's crying in floods of tears after the game. Loads of players are coming around him trying to support him. But for the most part, even if you hate Liverpool, you did feel quite sorry for him because no one wants to see a player, especially in a Champions League game, right? It's, during, it's, it's like, it's the one game in the season that everyone's looking forward to. The whole world is watching you and you made a fucking fatal, 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 fatal error, right? That leads to your team eventually losing the Champions League final. Um, goalkeepers are a lot like strikers in that respect, right? Um, they can make one mistake that can decide the game. Strikers can make one mistake that can decide the game too. I mean, they can make one error in finishing that can also tip the game uh, not in the balance of the team that they're playing for, right? So, Carrier's kind of fucked up in that respect. But even if you're someone that hates Liverpool, like I do, you kind of have to feel a bit sorry for him, right? You see him, look, you see him fucking in floods of tears. Are they, are they, are they real tears though? He looks a bit, a little bit crocodile-y to me, isn't it? I don't know, right? He's doing all that fucking... He's doing that, all that virtue signaling shit. Like, oh, I'm really sorry. You know, you know when people like score against their old team and like, oh, put their hands up. Like, hey, guys, I really respect you. Like, yeah, fuck off. Anyway, he fucks up, right? And it's a constant thing. And oh, and so he fucks up. And then the story transpires that supposedly he had a concussion during the game. 
Now, there's a clip um, that went around the internet showing Sergio Ramos uh, elbowing, like charging into carriers after a corner and kind of knocking him down, right? To kind of like leaving his arm out and knock him in the head. And supposedly they're saying that that happened just before he rolled the ball out. So he was a bit dizzy. And then he went to hospital and it, and it got proven that he had a concussion. But it's like, come on, man. Fucking hell, Liverpool. Like, it's never your fault, right? It's always someone else's fault. Can't you just take the loss on the chin, right? You guys lost to the better team. You're always going to lose anyway, right? You Let's just say you're always going to lose. There was a 50-50 chance you might win. But for the most part, you were the firm, firm, firm underdogs, right? Mermudid were always going to win this cup. It was just in the in the books, right? Zidane ends up um, walking away from Madrid afterwards. You know, Ronaldo does his cryptic messaging after the the game. Bale was sort of like casting doubts whether or not he'll stay or not and putting pressure on Florentine Perez. It was written in the stars that they were going to win. Somehow, Liverpool kind of are running with this idea that um, Karius was concussed. That's why he fucked up, and they just and he rolled out. He rolled the ball out to Benzema, and ended up knocking it into an empty net. It's like, come on, man, have some self respect, man. You lost a game. Now, Karius, I know if you're a football player, it's a big moment for you, and it might be able, it might kind of define your career, but not really. It's football. People make mistakes all the time. You fucked up. Cool. Put your hands up as you are in this fucking picture, and just move on. Move on, man. Move on. Move on. But to say the concussion was what led to the mistake is ridiculous because. If we take that, if we take that step further, can't we say that every player, most players on the football pitch, if we fucking analyze all twenty-two players on that on that pitch, I'm sure the majority of them would show signs of concussions, especially when they're heading the ball, right? I think there's been research that's been shown that heading the ball isn't the most healthiest thing to do, right? Especially how they pump the balls in the Premier League, they're fucking rock hard or a clash of heads or falling on the floor from high heights. You're obviously going to get concussed. That's without goes without saying, but. Your concentration wasn't where it should be, and you fucked up on the highest stage, on the biggest stage, in front of one of the, maybe the best strikers in the world in Benzema, right? He might not be everyone's cup of tea, but you can't roll the ball out like that in, in his vicinity and not pay the price, you know? This isn't Emil Heskey. But to suggest that the concussion from Ramos is what caused it is fucking annoying. And I was happy that so fucking Serge Ramos during the international break addressed the situation with a kind of a really, really funny reply that I'll read out to you guys, right? So it's here. Serge Ramos hits back over Mo Salah injury. Uh, he grabbed me first. So let me quickly read this to you because I thought this was quite funny, right? Because usually football players are quite devoid of a personality or they kind of uh, toe the party line and they don't really say anything about what actually happened situation-wise. But let me read this to you. Let me get the screen up properly. So here we go. Uh, Sergio Ramos says, Mo Salah could have played on Liverpool Champions League final defeat if he had an injection in his injured arm. Good point. Real Madrid uh, defender Ramos said Salah instigated a tussle between the players which led to the Egyptian forward leaving the game in tears during the first half. Man, what's it with uh, Liverpool players crying, right? They cry all the time. They fucking love a good cry, innit? Fucking man up, man. Stop crying. The fuck is this, man? Players that get injured and cry just pisses me the fuck off. Really does. Do you remember when Neymar cried during the World Cup final against Germany because he got, no, no semi final because he got injured? And all the players held up his fucking shirt before the Germany uh, final, like he died or something, and they got banged 7 1. Don't cry. That's what happens when you get bloody jinx. I hate people that cry during football games. It's stupid. Especially if you're watching your own, you're watching a team that you support play and they lose. You're not playing. Why are you crying for? You're a support of the club. The club will carry on, man. You think those players are going to cry? They're going to go home and fucking smash their pe- their 10 out of 10 um, Victoria's Secret model wives and go and buy tons of Rick Owens and St. Laurent and chill in a beach somewhere in the middle of fucking Mallorca. They don't give a shit. Why are you crying? Ugh. Oh. Liverpool goalkeeper uh, uh, Loris Carriers has collided, uh, also collided with Ramos and ha- has subsequently been judged to have suffered a concussion in the 3-1 defeat. Egyptian lawyer Basim Wahab, they've got a lawyer involved. No way. Uh, launched a one billion lawsuit against Ramos amid fears Salah may be unable to represent his national side against World Cup. What the fucking fuck, man? This is why people hate Liverpool. Right? You you had Luis Suarez calling bloody players Negroes, right? You had him biting players, right? You had Steven Gerrard being Steven Gerrard, an absolute donkey, right? You had Graham Sunes talking shit on Sky Sports, huh? You have Kenny Dalglish, the absolute Cretan, wearing that fucking uh, Hugh, Lur, uh, Luis Suarez t-shirt, right? When he was there, King Kenny, the bloated redhead dick, 
right? And now you have Mo Salah's lawyer trying to sue Ramos for a billion dollars, a billion euros, sorry, because of an injury. Are you serious? So, it goes on. The lawyer, um, amid fears, Salah may be able to represent the national side in the 2018 World Cup. Ramos says, bloody hell, <laughs> they've given this Salah thing a lot of attention. I didn't want to speak about this because everything is being magnified, Ramos told AS. I remember the play well. He grabs my arm first and I fell to the other side, which might be true or might not be true, right? The injury happened to the other arm and they said that I gave him the judo hold, which interest I didn't know the injury happened to not actually the arm he held, but the other arm as he fell down. After that, the goalkeeper said I dazed him with a clash. I spoke with Salah through messages. He was quite good. He, he could have played on if he got an injection for the second half. I've done it sometimes, but when Ramos does something like this, it sticks a little bit more. So, we now have learned that Ramos and Salah have had a conversation. Salah was obviously crying after the game, but maybe due to emotion, maybe because he's a wet blanket, whatever, it doesn't matter. But, you know, he was cool with it. He probably thinks he could have probably gone on if he took an in, a quarter zone injection or something. But And I'm assuming the lawyer's protecting the... Um, the rights of his player, right? And making sure that all things are covered and he's suing Ramos is just a probably, it's a it's one of those um, exercises, right? Where they're going to probably settle outside of court anyway, regardless, cool. So everything's fine in that regard. And Ramos continues, I don't know if it's because you're at Real Madrid for so long and win for so long that people look at it a different way. Probably true. Being a United fan, we know that for true. We know that for sure. Everyone fucking hates United. Um, I'm I'm only missing <laughs> Roberto Firmino saying he got a cold because a drop of sweat landed on him. I thought that was fucking funny as fuck. <laughs> you know, like who else are they gonna blame? It's like fucking uh, Tottenham with uh, Pizzagate and shit, or that or that lasagna, right? Do you remember that lasagna thing when everyone got sick or food poisoning, whatever it may have been, and they missed out on fourth place? Sports teams should never do this kind of thing, man. Never, never lower yourself to making excuses. Um, especially players in that regard. Like, you just look at a fucking idiot. I think fans can get a bit partisan and a bit and a bit stupid and a bit crazy, right? I think we're allowed to do that because, you know, maybe you're emotionally invested and maybe your only outlet to let out your aggression is your football club and maybe you've supported this team for years and whatever it may be. You just love sports, right? I think we're allowed to do this, but I think the players should have a little bit more class, should be a little bit more sportsmanlike, a little bit more professional, right? And just... Accept a mistake for what it is. You're a football player. You made a mistake, Carriers. Mo Salah, you got a freak injury. You landed on the, you landed um, on the floor on your opposite arm in a weird angle, dislocated your shoulder. I'm sorry it happened during the World Cup year. I'm sorry it happened during the last game before the World Cup, but these things happen. You know, like um, Tony Ferguson before a, a, a title fight with uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov, N- N- whatever his name is, right? tripped over a cable doing some filming and busted his knee now maybe his knee would have got already was already busted anyway but he aggravated it by falling over some cables when he was filming these things happen freak accidents can happen but come on man be a sportsman don't start blaming the cable company suing the ufc suing ramos for a billion euros a billion euros really are we for real what the fuck's going on here man god damn it man Allow it. That's why I fucking hate Liverpool so much. So annoying. They they finish in the league a hundred points behind everyone else, right? They somehow are jamming enough to win uh, to get through to the Champions League final, right? They play a team who they're huge, huge underdogs to win against, right? And somehow they lose, and they don't have the class to say, you know what? We lost because we weren't the better team. Our goalkeeper let us down. Our strikers didn't score when they were meant to score. Our midfielders are shit. Our defenders aren't that great. We've got one good defender in Virgil van Dijk, centre-back, right? That's it. Get it. Get that through your head, man. Shitting fuckers. Oh, annoying as hell, Liverpool. I honestly, they're honestly one of the most annoying teams ever out there. Like, it's never their fault, right? Just a huge club of just blame culture, just crying all the time. Oh. Anyway, that's what happened with Liverpool. And, um... In other more interesting news, Manchester United have signed Diego 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 Dalot from FC Porto, which I'm fabulously happy about. We've got a right back or left back that actually looks like he can cross the ball, which is fucking amazing to see, right? Um, if you know anything about Antonio Valencia, you'd know he just fucking kicks, kicks it and crosses it, right? Kick, run, cross, but it doesn't really go anywhere. So it's great to see um, us sign a new player. Hopefully I can get him up now. Let me load it up quickly show you who this player is Fellaini please leave as well if you don't mind can you get the fuck out of our club 
No one wants you here. Jesus Christ. Um, but let me quickly show you what's happening with Manchester United. Maybe so. Actually, you know what? Who cares? Let me load, load it up. Anyway, that's what I want to say about Liverpool. I fucking hate them. They're the one of the most annoying clubs in the world. And yeah, it's just like, come on, man. You lost the game. You know, you lost the game to a better side. Just get over it. And they're even talking about during the bloody World Cup preparations. Like, imagine how annoyed you'd be being, being Ramos and being asked about a Champions League game and being asked about some freak injury that happened to a player. Like, ugh. Anyway, oh, this funny thing I saw on fucking Reddit. I love Reddit. Reddit, 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 Reddit for life, right? So I love this subreddit called Public Freakout where people just, you know, public freakouts. They get crazy in public. There's this video of this police officer trying to stop a water fight somewhere in America, right? Mistake number one, right? Um, if you know anything about water fights in the hood, you know they kind of get a bit leery. They get a bit crazy. Um, people go a bit nuts, especially when the sun's out, especially when everyone from the area's out, especially when you're all young and shit. There might be some girl in the area you're trying to impress. You might wet up a top a lot so you can see those little bubbles and whatever it might be, right? Um, you might want to, you know, show off to your mates. So you got the massive super. Remember that super circle with the double barrel shotgun shit in the, in, in the front of it? Coof, 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 coof. Fucking love that stuff. It's funny though, when I was younger, I, we never bought those super soakers brand new from shops. They were always something you bought second hand at a car boot sale. It's all like rollerblades and skateboards and stuff. I don't remember ever buying that stuff brand new. I think no, I think I remember buying a, a skateboard from like JD Sports or like JJB Sports for like temp, a Sonic. Like, you know those skateboards you buy from those sports stores where they they, they feel like a di they feel like a dining room table. There's no concave in it. You know the concave on the skateboard is sort of like meant to dip in a little bit where your kind of feet are meant to be so you can kind of, I don't know, jump up and down on it. But it just feels like a fucking dining room table. It's flat as fuck, right? Super uncomfortable. And the wheels are like, um, you know the wheels you have on your luggage? Like, they, they, they're wheels by, they're wheels by the pure, in the purest sense of being a wheel, but they're not really a wheel, right? You can't exactly roll it down things or get it upstairs. They just circle things that move, so they allow you to pull things along easier on the road. But imagine having that on a skateboard. So I remember that was our, that was our life when it came to super soakers in the hood. But I love, I used to love fight, uh, water fights, especially when somebody um, was able to like, because um, in the US you have those kind of uh, fire hydrant things, right? But here we have drains and sometimes... If someone was smart enough or they had a spanner, they could kind of uncork the drain, a particular drain that would let out loads of water on the streets, which was fucking sick as well. Or during, I think they've been banned now with hoses, but I remember if someone had a garden or some mum was watering her fucking roses in the front porch, she might like leave the hose on and you guys can kind of like spray yourselves or she might spray you in general. That was always cool. Or sometimes, I don't know now, it, with everyone being so politically correct and, and fucking everything is fucking sexual assault. But I remember sometimes if there were builders on the street, right? And they were fixing up a, uh, a pavement or whatever. Because sometimes they do that thing where they spray water and then they kind of like drill, right? Or they cut a bit of, a bit of concrete with some water in it. I'm assuming to help the drill bit to kind of go through a bit of concrete. Sometimes if you're riding by on a bike, they'd kind of spray you with the water too as you were kind of coming by, which is always fun. Or, or if you're running by sometimes, or you'd kind of like ask them and they'd spray it on top of you, which is always sick. I least love all that shit. But anyway, this lady decides to try and stop a fight in the a water a, 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 a water fight in the hood, and it goes exactly as you'd imagine, right? So I'm gonna show it to you guys. Um, hopefully, if you're watching it, you can see. If you're not on the audio, please bear with me, and um, I'll put a link. I'll actually put a link in the description so you guys can check it out yourself as well. But this made me laugh to no end because I love seeing girls fall over, right? In general, so this made me laugh no, to no end, to no fucking end. So hear this. It's really chasing the kid. Look. <laughs> oh my god. Play that again. She falls back. She falls face first, man. Obviously, because the pavement's mad wet. But the absolute rage, right? And you know what makes this video even better? Because there's a longer version of this video, right? Where you see the police officer being quite, the police woman is being quite reasonable. She's been going around telling people to kind of get out. Basically, what the complaint was was that they were playing in the street, in the kind of a busy street, so cars weren't able to get through, and the car, traffic was getting packed up. So she's telling people, "Come, continue doing your water fight thing, but just get off the roads." And obviously, because she's coming around telling people to get off the roads, you see this sort of like devilish look in everyone's faces as she's walking by them. She's got the super, they got super circles, and they're like they're sort of spraying a little by little on the back, or on the foot or above her head so everyone's kind of being a bit devilish right and she's kind of like having to like 
walk through this area, sort of like a scene in the wire, like, okay, cool, it's tense as fuck in here, right, and there's, like, fucking tons of black people in this area, right, it's just like a fucking jungle, and there's just, like, a couple <laughs> police officers with not that much backup, and no one's listening to her, right, so they obviously take advantage of it, and then she obviously just gets pissed off because no one's listening, and eventually start, people, kids start spraying her, right, and she just gets annoyed, and it's like, okay, fuck this, I'm gonna arrest someone, right, to kind of to kind of send the message that you guys are not listening and you're fucking around. So she then chases them. <laughs> she chases them. And then no you end up with this situation where she's running full pelt after someone in her full gear. Right? Her boots are probably wet already. You know, who's trying to run after someone? And it's like, <laughs> the lack of pace and the drop. <laughs> And then there's the fucking resignation when she gets up of like, I'm not going to catch this person. I'm not going to run again. And she just kind of gives up. Oh, my God. Being a police officer in America is the worst thing in the world, isn't it, right? In like a small neighborhood where people have little to no respect for your uniform, right? Where what you say doesn't really go that far. Where the only respect they have for you is when you get your gun out. Where if you just if you use excessive force because you had a long day and some little twerp is being a dick, someone records you, you you happen to be on World Star and people start to think you're a fucking racist, but the full video hasn't come out yet. And in some cases, some people are not really like. There's a video of a, that, remember that video of that girl getting beat up in a beach, right? She's getting punched. The full video comes out and it shows that you know the girl was a fucking dick, right? She was being a dick to the police officers. She was being purposely obstructive she wasn't she wasn't uh, resisting she was resisting arrest she was being rude she was um saying loads of really shitty things so police are just swearing to them whatever malarkey kicking at kicking at them a little bit sometimes so some the the violence obviously wasn't justified but you can understand why they punched him in the face so it's that it's that bill burr bit right of like um uh when he's talking about how feminists can never understand why someone can you know you should never be able to hit a woman nothing should ever make you want to hit someone it's like mm, there are things that can make you hit a woman right so there's a there's a video clip and it shows you her pip a guy punching his woman on the beach and you're like oh my god it's ridiculous but when you watch the full clip you kind of understand why it escalates that point now that's not excusing what he did but you can understand why someone would snap but the full video comes out and no one cares because the narrative's already been set right the police officer doesn't know what they're doing um they are misogynist, they're violent, they got short tempers, they don't know how to control people without using excessive force, blah, 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 blah. So being a police officer is sort of like being a president, right? Who would, who, would, who would willingly take that job, right? Someone hates you out there. Even if you're Barack Obama and you're someone that's well-read, you're very articulate, you come across very well, you represent the, the, the White House or the, or, or, the, or, the, or the presidency in a very honorable and professional manner, the Republicans still hate you, right? They still call your wife a monkey. They still get annoyed when you wear a cream suit. Um, you know, whatever. They still hate you for fuck's sake, right? So, in the police, in the police officers' um, fashion, there's still gonna be a population, a, a, a big swab of population that you're policing who are just gonna hate your fucking guts, regardless of how nice you are, regardless of how many times you get up on the stage and start fucking cripping and shit and dancing and milly rocking all that malarkey, right? No one cares, right? For the most part, people hate police officers. So it's sort of like a weird job people um, willingly take on, right? They're like, you know what? I'm gonna be a cop, man. It's like, fuck that noise, man. Fuck being someone, fuck being hated just being hated for just being hated sake like that's long man long 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 and yeah um big up to that police officer trying to stop a a water fight in the hood but jesus christ man that made me love to know it that made me fucking giggle 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 um what else i saw that i thought was funny uh oh yeah shit so i saw this video of the most smallest apartment in the uk right um, a video that CNN did, I think it's from a while back, is it? Uh, yeah, from 2012. But check this fucker out, right? This this is one of the smallest apartments in London. And it goes to show that London is one of those weird places when it comes to houses, right? Or the, or, or the housing market, right? Where it's not necessarily what your place looks like. It's always comes back to that old energy of like location, location, location. doesn't matter what your place looks like. If the location is great, you can you can justify charging a crazy amount uh, of money for it, right? Because I remember once when um, we were just about to move in together, me and a brunette, I remember looking at a place in Brick Lane 
um, just behind like a Chinese shop, right? So if you know anything about East London, you know Brick Lane is sort of like the touristy area just before you you end up at Shoreditch or like in terms of like a Hoxton or whatever area. It's quite trendy. And there's loads of like Indian shops, Chinese shops, takeaways in general, just nice little restaurants or whatever area, right? And all the houses for the most part are like flats. So if you're unlucky, you might have find a flat, or if you're lucky, you might find a flat in Brick Lane, but for the most part, it's going to be overlooking a restaurant or behind or up on top of a restaurant. And unlucky for us, it was on top of a Chinese restaurant, so it stunk like fucking shit, right? It's high heaven. And this Chinese restaurant was very popular. And then the flat itself, right, was um, the door to get to the flat was behind the, Chinese, was behind the Chinese restaurant. So the bin was next to the door, right, where they throw their shit. And the door itself was a really narrow door. It had three sets of stairs that kind of went up like that, right? Really high stairs too. Those weird sort of like high metal stairs. When you, if you fall and you trip, you're going to bust up your entire shin. And then the room itself was like a massive sort of studio space room with like hardly any natural lighting because it had like one thin window at the top of the ceiling, right? And they were charging like, I don't know, uh, £1,200 a month without bills. Now, the location itself was amazing, right? You could walk to Shoreditch Station in five minutes, Liverpool Street Station in probably 10. Uh, you could cycle to most places within Cambridge Heath, Bethnal Green, Mile Lane, if you work in that kind of area. So if you worked in that kind of area or the kind of creative industry or you're freelancing or whatever and you went to hot desk somewhere around those areas, perfect for you, right? But 1,200 for a one-room place, right, with hardly any natural lighting that was on top of a Chinese restaurant. Fuck you! And it was super small. The room was, the, it was like one big room, sort of like a kitchen with a living room put together. And the bedroom was so tiny and the shower was even smaller. The shower was like in a cupboard. Luckily, the place that we live in now in Stratford, it's sort of like a big room, hence why I'm filming now in the back of me. You've got like a massive kitchen, a really big room, a big, really big bedroom and a really big bathroom. So it kind of, you know, lends itself to it. But we sort of live away from the trendy bit. So we're like, I don't know, let's say 20 minutes away from the main parts of trendy East London. But this video highlights just how crazy the market um, place is in London. This is from 2012, right? So imagine what it must be like now. So I'll let it play now. You guys can hear it. compact others be you there are pa de terres and studios then there's flat 8f <laughs> nothing quite prepares you for something so small this is it all of it there is no more Ten foot four by eight foot four. I can't touch from one side to the other without hitting the wall. I am six foot one tall. And this is the length of the flat. The apartment is a converted porter's toilet. Yo, dude. In case you're not watching this video, right? So as, as like I mentioned, I don't know if anyone says that in a sentence. I am six foot one tall, right? Usually someone says, how tall are you? Or what's your height? And you say, six one or like 180 centimeters. But you don't say six foot one tall, do you? Weird way of forming a sentence. Anyway, regards, if you're not watching this, right? This guy's in this tiny apartment. Tiny, 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 tiny apartment in London, right? So tiny that he can lie down, right? A six foot one guy, head to toe. And he can't even put, he can't even stretch his hands fully, right? And that kind of is the entire length of the flat. But the most crazy thing that I didn't think about, which was quite ingenious, but also kind of disgusting, is that the toilet is inside the shower. So obviously, if you've got a micro flat, you need to find that way of putting a, a toilet and a shower in the same room, plus a kitchen, plus a bedroom, plus a living room, whatever. So somehow they figured out an ingenious way of putting a shower, the toilet inside the shower. So if you want to shit, so you can actually shit and shower for real. You know, some people love having a bidet. You don't even need a bidet. You can just shit and shower. But that means you have to strip completely naked, right? And then shit and then shower. So imagine your friends visiting you, right? And you're coming at the toilet completely starkers. Or ask your friend to give you a towel through your fucking curtain because you took a shit. And also, bloody hell, man. What kind of nonsense is this? Like, what kind of bullshit? 
is it that you have to live in a fucking flat somewhere that small? This is what, you know, that's what sometimes they say, you know, um, the 21st century or living in the West is uh, we're so advanced and we've taken things further than ever been before. But this isn't taking things further. This isn't living, right? I'd much rather live in an apartment somewhere in fucking Middlesex or in Bristol or in Brighton, right? With my own room and having my own dignity and be able to shower in peace and take a shit in peace than fucking sitting in the shower, right? And shitting. I don't know. Again, I don't know how hygienic that is either, right? I don't know the levels of hygiene. I don't know how that works, right? Shitting and showering in the same place must be fucking insane, right? I don't know how you're going to get that fucking, that fucking shit miss or that shower miss out of your room in that small square, but God almighty, man. Some people are living the fucking harsh life, but anyway, let's look, let the video continue for a bit. In cloakroom, it tasks even the estate agent's vocabulary. Unusual, unique, Interesting marketing opportunity. I would point out the high ceiling. I would point out the natural light coming through. I would point out the potential refurbishment, the location. Yo, that guy can sell ISO Eskimo for real. He fucking sold that to me. Location, refurbishment, natural light. I'm all over it now, you know? And they open all the windows. Obviously, they've got no curtains there, so it might make it look dark. Uh, it's all kind of neutral tones. You could probably do something smarter with it. it. For sure. For sure. Get that toilet out of the shower, right? For sure. Get that toilet out of the fucking shower. One million percent. You could turn it into some sort of tourist attraction. People could come in. Oh, I'm saying it's really Minecraft house. <laughs> right? You could have a really big exaggerated chair that looks, like a, that looks like a chair, but it's really a bed. You could do some interesting things with it, but fucking hell, man. The original asking price of $145,000 has been well exceeded. The current top offer is believed to be around 280,000. Yo, people people are not only wanting to buy this flat, which I understand because everyone's going to buy something it's in a good location, it's in central London, but they're bidding for it. They're bidding for this flat. <coughs> what the fuck? One simple reason. The old rule, location, location, location. This tiny apartment is in the best part of London and next to the top people's department store, Harrods. You've got Harrods food hall opposite. Who needs a kitchen? With this postcode, you're going to get a hell of a lot of it. Fair enough, it's next to Harrods, but when have you ever wanted to go to Harrods when you were in your flat sometime? I don't understand it. Maybe it's sort of like, you know, um, I live next to Westfield, right? And I can count on one hand the times I've been to Westfield since I've lived here or since it's been built. I've lived here before Westfield was built and I have only been there, what, five, less than five times, I think, in my life. So to, 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 to suggest somehow that you're living in next to Harrods, that you're going to, you know, wander into Harrods and, I don't know, buy yourself a Goyard wallet um, every other weekend is fucking insane. But maybe if you're able to afford such a place in such a postcode, you will do that. But bloody hell, man. The demand for this unique property has been intense more than a hundred viewings a dozen offers ironically the winner is likely to be an investor from greece now you know i guess ironically maybe because the greek economy has gone down or maybe because the housing market in london is usually dominated by uh, foreigners and stuff but man i've never i've never really had that much of an interest of having an apartment in the middle of london or anywhere near where tourists tend to kind of um uh hang around in Shafford is bad enough as it is especially westfield because a lot of people come especially if you're a tourist people especially the, the people that have been to london a few times and know the area quite well they sometimes are smart enough to get an airbnb around stratford or around leytonstone and kind of travel into west london and usually they kind of like do some of their shopping in westfield because it's not as busy as the main stratford's as the main oxford street station uh, place which is oh you don't have as many options off the street but it's less busy and blah 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 but i'd never i've never fantasized about living in Oxford street or bond street like why would you do that it's like living in times square it's like it's a nonsense like that's and that's not even a representation of the the city you're in um as great as it is to walk around harrods or suffrages um during a weekend or during a weekday just to kind of people watching stuff and stuff it doesn't really really accurately describe or illustrate what london's really about um i much prefer to live somewhere around here or like in hackney or whatever in dawson or in south london or somewhere north 
But I don't know, it's b- bizarre, bizarre. People that live in that kind of, in that way, those kind of micro apartments, it's fucking garbage. It's weird because there was a moment, there was a time when I was younger where I kind of went to live in like, you know those Parisian micro uh, apartments where the bed falls out from the wall and the kitchen is like under the roof and all that shit. Because I just thought it was like, it's like a go-go gadget shit, right? That's what I kind of had the idea of like, you're kind of living like a spy. But the older you get, the more you realise that you spend a lot of time at work, you spend a lot of time at home. You want both places to be comfortable. You don't want to hate this job that you do, and you don't want to fucking live in a fucking in in a in a fucking shoebox either, right? You want to live somewhere comfortable. Where you can come back and unwind, have a smoke, have a drink, chill out, you know, whatever. Hang out with your girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. Maybe you want, want to, you want to have somewhere like you can just chill and relaxing. So the idea of like um, sacrificing uh, relaxation space. Um, privacy for a postcode is nuts man absolutely nuts but yeah i saw that i was like jesus christ man people are people are crazy if you want to live in a place like that you are absolutely nuts sir oh shit forgot to say there's a new documentary coming out about studio 54 have you have you seen that awesome right before i get onto that quickly mention this book called holy terror that i'm tearing through an autobiography on um um, andy warhol by his close friend bob calacello an amazing amazing book right um I think a lot of people in the scene or a lot of people coming up who want to kind of make inroads in whatever scene that they're in, any sort of micro culture, any sort of micro subculture, any sort of scene in general, whether it's digital, whether it's offline. I think you, you'd, be, you'd be remiss not to read this book because there's a lot of stuff about etiquette, a lot of stuff about how to conduct yourself in crowds and kind of around interesting people that really, really sparked interest with me. And there's this bit particularly in the book where Bob tells about Bob talks about how Andy Warhol hated people who asked him for things, right? People that asked for favors. And the reason why I said that, because I remember seeing on Instagram, loads of people sending or tweeting pictures of screenshots of like um, conversation they're having with certain young kids who are eager to get involved and want kind of suggestions on how to get started, on how to do parties, on how to become an influencer, how to be uh, a consultant for a brand, right? And people are always, and these people are always sort of like, um, the people they're asking are kind of disparaging, right? In terms of posting, publicly posting the messages on their social feeds, but also they're li- it's a little bit disingenuous how they kind of go about it saying that, you know, you shouldn't go about it this way and not really offering advice on how to do it the right way, kind of, right? I understand sometimes it can be annoying anyway to kind of give people advice because you kind of figure it out. But I think the right advice is what uh, Bob Costello mentioned that um, Andy H- so basically essentially, I'm trying to find in the book. I wish I, could, I probably should have uh, marked it off with a little postage, man, but I did highlight it. But he did hate people asking for things. And the way kind of he kind of did like it is when people did stuff without being asked, right? And I think that's a very good example of something. And also, Bob Andy, Andy Warhol preferred people that were actually around. Not people that, you know, people that ask for things and who aren't around, who don't partake or are not around the kind of like social circle. Because he mentions a lot, they mention a lot in this book, which is, which is fucking weird to see that the whole idea about being the socialite or being the person in the scene that was at any opening, store opening, bar opening, nightclub opening, gallery opening that was a thing that happened even back in the 60s and 70s right this idea of like uh being seen or putting yourself out there right and andy war hated people who would ask him for things who weren't necessarily about so the idea was that you should actually put yourself around these environments put plug yourself into the actual uh culture right tap yourself in log in and then through the process of just being around, bumming into people, sharing a drink, uh, someone asking for a, someone asking for a lighter, I don't know, turning up to an after party. Over time, maybe the ask will come. But I'm also a big believer in not even asking for the ask. Like offer you offer yourself. Like give a service that no one even is even asking you for. If you're a photographer and you go to these events, take loads of pictures and then send them for free to the people that host the events without without expecting anything in return. I think that's the biggest thing in life. But I think nowadays we live in a we live in a world where Maybe it's the fact of instant gratification with social media, but I think most so it's the fact that there is a lack of appreciation um, of just working hard, diligently on something and not getting anything in return. Because I think there's a, there's a story that we will hear that if you work hard enough, eventually something will happen. Sometimes nothing happens, right? But the pure love of just being around and partaking is much better than the idea of like gaining something from it, right? You feel better that you've, 
you you were there and that so and so person knows your face, uh, knows your face enough to give you a head nod, or you're known enough in that environment to get on the guest list or to know where the party's gonna be, or you're known enough to like know about a certain brand before other people know about it or about a certain author. I think that's in, that should be enough than the actual monetary or positional or occupational career uh, go, um, thing that you might be chasing after. But no one really wa wants that because the process sounds boring. Everyone wants the thing, right? Everyone wants to be at the place, at the whatever. But just taking part is good enough. And Andy Warhol mentioned it a few times. I hate people asking for things. I think this book really is a good way of really understanding of how it, what it means to be plugged into culture and how to kind of conduct yourself in a great way. Because Bob Costello somehow managed to be Andy Warhol's right hand man without actually being Andy Warhol's like without sucking anything out from him, right? Because I think that's the kind of I remember someone mentioned this before on a podcast. Who was I think it might have been A side mentioned it on uh, um, what's it called? Um, something lunch, corporate lunch podcast, right? GQ podcast. I link to it in the link below too. A side for no Vincent mentioned it. How there's people, the people he hangs around, especially the high profile people, they're always on guard because they never they never know if someone's talking to them because they want to talk to them or talking to them because of their profile of who they are. So. If any, if any, if there ever was a cheat code in order to kind of get involved and to kind of feel a part of the culture, that would be the cheat code. Why don't you go to these events instead of being the person that asks for a picture, instead of being the person that's asking for career advice, why don't you just be the person that just hangs out or who does the really plain appreciation of what they're doing? Like if you see Frank Ocean at a party, instead of fucking gushing over him for half an hour, just say, hey man, I love you, I'm a big fan, keep doing what you're doing, you're really inspirational. Or you 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 guided me for a really tough moment in my life. And I just want to say thank you, man. Like keep doing what you're doing and walk away. Or don't say anything. Just head nod and appreciate it for what it is. That is probably more powerful than trying to extract something because someone of that stature is very sensitive. Is very keenly aware, right, of um, that feeling. Because we all get it. You know when someone's. You know when it's like. Uh, you know when you're in a st tube station. And you're coming out and those people that want to help, help want you to like sign up to a charity are kind of like zeroing in on you. You can feel it, that neediness, right? Of like when you need to sign a bit of paper so then that you can um, donate a certain amount of money a month when you don't want to do it, right? You feel as if you're being obliged to do it. The same thing for a celebrity. The same thing for somebody of influence or somebody that you want to get close to. The way to get close to them is to offer your services for free. Offer your services with no expectation. Offer your services because you just want to be involved. You just want to have some, you just want to show your friends, oh, look, guess what? I worked with so-and-so, right? But also, just plug yourself in. Be part of the culture. Attend these things. Go. Hang out. But also, don't feel as if, like... Because this is, this, is, this is the weird dichotomy of this thing. Because I've, I, I listened to Joey Diaz say, give Lee Sayat. Joey Diaz is a famous comedian. He gave Lee Sayat, who's kind of like his right-hand man, who helped produce his podcast. He gave him some advice. And the advice was very telling. He said something along the lines of, because Joey Diaz is very well-known in the comedy community, and he, he, he interviews some of the biggest comedians in the scene... And Lee Syatt, by proxy of being in the same studio as him, also has access to his comedians. He says that Lee Syatt should be careful that he doesn't feel like the poor friend hanging out with rich friends, right? Where you hang out with your rich friends so much, you feel as if you're in the same tax bracket as them when you're not, right? So sometimes hanging out with really famous people or really culturally influential people, it can sometimes skew and kind of distort your own sense of self. And it can kind of make you think you're further along than you should be which could sometimes lead to you expecting more than you should be getting what you should be doing is humbly humbly putting yourself in an environment where you're around these people to soak up game and then ducking out i remember i used to do this quite often when i was in the scene new in london right and i kind of uh fell off it uh towards the end of it but i used to always go to these events all the time i'd go to any sort of gallery event any new store opening any um bar opening whatever it may be any sort of like gig that involves someone cool in the scene right but i dip before the end always dip so i want to show my face let people know who i am right i've got quite a new i've got quite a fucking unique face and my hair's always been high or big right so someone you'd always see me around but I'd always dip never stay longer than you need to stay always leave and then over time, over time, when people get to know you a bit more, or even if they don't get to know you, you will maybe um, foster a new community. You'll maybe meet some new friends who you might end up doing something else with yourself. Like you might end up kind of just like leaving and kind of doing your own thing on the side. But get yourself involved in culture. Under, like take part. That's the thing I got from this book, Holy Terror. An amazing, amazing, amazing book. And to talk about Holy Terror, 
because obviously um, Andy Warhol was a permanent fixture at Studio 54. There's this great documentary coming out about Studio 54, and this is a trailer. Hopefully, they don't take this video down on YouTube because these guys keep taking down my videos. Um, but I'll just play it. I'll play the first 30 seconds for you now on YouTube. Hopefully, you can check it out. And I'll also link this on the show notes below if you're listening for your audio. When you walk through those blacked out doors, you are in another world. Andy Warhol, Alvin Klein, Elizabeth Taylor, Mick Jagger. It was hot, sexy. It's like an adult amusement park. It is so preposterous. We both came from Brooklyn. They had this understanding that they were getting out. Just, just in case it kind of takes me off YouTube, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it there. But yeah, a new documentary coming out about Studio 54. I've seen some listings about it online, so that might be... Uh, it's called Studio 54, the documentary. Um, it's going to come out on the 15th of June. Um, there's a link on the description that shows you loads of places that you can go and check it out um, in terms of local listings in your area. And it's going to be amazing. Studio 54, if you obviously know, it's one of, the, one of those kind of uh, instrumental, influential clubs in the 70s in New York kind of fostered in the era of disco and um, very hedonistic kind of like drug fuel place but also a place where it allowed a high low of culture to kind of all congregate in this one area which i fucking love right the democracy of the nightclub right that's why people love hanging out during night times or going out to after parties of um fashion shows or gallery events because you get to see people from various socioeconomics uh, levels interacting in this in this democrat in this democratic place called the dance floor with a dj playing amazing tunes and you get to see different weird people all around you you get to connect to different people and it just fosters an amazing community i know for me personally that's where my love of dj my life of love love my love of night culture kind of came from kind of going out every weekend or most most days from tuesday to sunday and plug yourself into culture and i think this book plus this documentary is coming out if you're an, if you're someone that's in the scene that wants to kind of get involved please read holy terror i recommend this book to you so much it kind of really does um give you a blueprint of how and read holy terror in the perspective not of andy warhol the main star read it more as a bob Capsello, the guy at the back here right because i think that's another kind of like um error people make because andy warhol is the lionel messi of his in industry right he's the outlier but we're more we're more likely to be a bob than we are likely to be an andy right so in order to be a bob in order to be someone that's able to kind of produce this kind of amazing book that's gonna you know it's it was made a long time ago it's a it's been a big seller it's kind of gonna it's gonna it's gonna have its peaks and waves when it's really popular but it's something that he can kind of put on his masthead and say look look what i contributed to culture to be that person that's able to to be a joy to be around is very difficult right it's not it's a lot harder than you think it is to be um a supporting cast member who people like having around so this book when you read it please read it in the perspective of bob read it as a right hand man read it as somebody of like how do i become that person who's a permanent fixture in a scene without being annoying without ending up being um falling into the pitfalls that my idols or people that i look up to fall into and that's where i'd kind of encourage you to do it so please if you're in the scene and you really want to get involved check out holy terror it's an amazing fucking book and i can't wait to see his fucking documentary um, um and next time actually I'll, I'll i'll log in a bit that says it but it does mention that he hates people that asked him for things in his book hopefully i get the where is it man um love interviews for me to be there, la, la, la. But it's and he says andy wall says he hates people that ask him for things which is i thought was very very interesting imagine imagine that let me see if I, can, if I can find it i've highlighted so many bits in this book that na, na, na. andrea Feldman. You know books you read where it's like so good that you can't you can't finish it. You always think of little things, ideas, and whatever. Oh, talking about books and going out to fifty four. I am DJing at the Heathcote and Star on June twenty fourth. Um, coming out very very soon. So if you want more info on that, please check out my website exionzinger dot com and it's got the fly and all my DJ listings on there for you to check out. Um, let me see if I can find this quote. Can I find it? No. Uh, Fuck! On DVD official, he always mentioned all kinds of kings and queens. Fred preferred to draw a token. Oh, this is interesting. So there's this guy um, who comes in later in Andy Warhol's and Fred and Bob Costello's life called Fred, right? And here's what he expected from Andy Warhol when he decided to work for Andy Warhol. Um, uh, Fred preferred to draw a token salary of a hundred dollars a week in exchange for unlimited expenses. 
This is something, again, which I think kind of goes un unsaid in the industry or in the scene in general. Sometimes if you are lucky enough to kind of uh, graduate the levels of um, scene apprenticeship, right, and you kind of go from attending events to socializing to taking part to maybe doing a guest list or working with somebody, right? The idea is sometimes you want to cash out. You want to you be salaried, right? But sometimes taking the least amount, right, and always being around is the best option than actually getting trying to get paid and then the person is like thinking whether or not they need you or not right because if you go if you if you just say to somebody um just pay me a hundred quid pay me 50 pounds pay for my uber right um no pay me 50 pounds and then pay for my uber right back and forth for a whole week of the event if you're helping out someone for a fashion imagine you're helping out um samuel ross for a cold war fashion show right and you're gonna do the after party why don't you say to samuel samuel ross just cover my expenses, right? You know, or give me a, give me a hundred pound for petty cash and just cover my Ubers back and forth to where I want to go. And I'll make sure everything is set up like it's, it's on deck. He's going to keep you around, I think, for a lot longer than you'd expect it to be. Instead of you going, oh, I want to I want to be salary. I want to be paid two grand a month. Because if, if anything, he could probably get someone to do it for free. But nowadays, because people are so entitled, you would probably will do it for free. But I think the real cheat code is to get close to these people, especially if you want to get, especially in me personally, I could give a fucking Scooby Doo about getting close to anyone, right? I'd want to do my own thing, right? And kind of bring the community to me. But if you do want to get close to somebody and you do want to be, because um, I think there is something very honorable and something very amazing about being the 23rd employee at Cold War or the 37th employee at um, Kiko's brand, whatever, right? There's something really honorable about being um, a really good supporting cast member. The best way to do it is to ask for as little as possible so that you can always be around. But then always over deliver. So don't ask for as little as possible. Don't get don't do what Fred did. No, don't 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 follow the Fred template and just ask for $100 uh, plus unlimited expenses and then not deliver um great work. Deliver the work of somebody that's been paid 60 grand, 80 grand, 100 grand a year. And trust me, trust the process, you will get so much further in life than you'd imagine. I guarantee you. That's the cheat code. That's, that's, that's a real way to kind of get yourself into culture and really, really um, carve out your own lane. And like I said before, please read Holy Terror. There's so many gems in this. I can't even... Um, there's not enough time for me to kind of go deep into and plug into. Like I said, like I've got there's so many bits in here that I've, that I've highlighted and shit that like you can probably see here in the video I'm going to show, right? Loads of sections I've highlighted that I thought were amazing loads of even just little lines whatever so definitely check it out i highly recommend it uh holy terror by bob calicello colicello um really really amazing book that kind of details this whole era of like studio 54 andy warhol's factory and this whole shenanigans anyway what else did i want to speak about body boom by the bum oh have, have you guys seen these so these these shoes are they're coming out as part of an undercover collaboration, but now they're kind of you know as per usual Nike always does this sort of shit, right? They let a brand kind of launch a shoe softly, um, if it kind of uh, garners a big reaction, then they kind of bring it as a GR. So this shoe is called uh, Nike React Element Eighty Seven. It fucking looks amazing. Loads of cues of like an old school kind of runner, right? In terms of the shape and the overall silhouette. But I love the sole. It kind of reminds me of a hookah, like really thick sole. But I'd assume it's not that thick because the, probably the, in, the the actual sole base is probably a little bit lower than what it looks like. Than what it looks like itself. But I love the upper of it. And it kind of comes from the same family as... No, the initial shoe is going to be launched under the whole Gaiokusu, the John, John, John Takashi undercover sort of imprint. But then they've also got this um, launching very, very soon, which I think looks fucking fabulous. Like, I honestly, honestly cannot wait to get my hands on these. Like, these look absolutely amazing. Like, when swaggy running shoes take over, man, they look fucking so cool. So I need a new pair of running shoes, actually, because mine are already fucked up as it is. Talking about shoes in general, as swaggy as Jordan 1s are, can we just, can we all admit that these are the most uncomfortable shoes in the world? They're so uncomfortable, man. I wore these yesterday, the other day, because I had a, I had a little Rick Owens outfit on that was all black and white, so I thought I'd kind of throw these on. And number one, these aren't the best leather, right? Because as you can see from the toe box, they're all kind of deformed, whatever. Uh, these are standard grs that i've kind of written on and it says here on the soul uh all life is an experiment you know which is very very true um but these are very 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 uncomfortable the soul is incredibly thin right um you feel every single inch of the floor when you're walking the toe is incredibly pointy but it's also weird because it's quite wide on this bit here because i've got wide feet so this bit here is quite wide but then the actual toe box itself is very 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 narrow right on the jordan one 
And then what happens if that if I size up on these, it ends up being too long. It ends up being long enough for the length but too wide. And if I end up getting my exact size, I end up having to break them in with the insole, which ends up making my feet, my toes pop out the front. It end up being this little pointy thing. But I think Jordan ones, they look swaggy as fuck because they they're probably the, the the best Jordans that look. They're probably the only Jordans that look the best with jeans, a, a suit, or whatever it may be. Right? They look they look very nice, right? But in terms of comfortability, they're fucking garbage, in my opinion. Again, in my personal opinion, um, I'm still I think I'm still a fan favorite of the Jordan Four. I think they still look probably my favorite Jordan, and maybe closely followed by maybe the Jordan Six. I'd say, but these are so uncomfortable, man. Like I I just I don't know, just kind of pops in my head. But yeah, Jordan One's uncomfortable as fuck. Um, what else I want to speak about to you? Um, uh, oh, sneakers and stuff has got sold supposedly. Hear about that, right? Sneakers and stuff got sold for fifty-seven million, but supposedly it didn't get sold for fifty-seven million, and the people and the kind of the founders had to kind of clear it up, which I was happy about, right? Because sneaker culture is booming, absolutely booming right now, right? And it'll be fucking silly to cash out right now, unless the passion for the industry kind of wavered and they weren't really feeling as much as before they maybe cash out and go and live on an island somewhere and have a hot model feed you grapes right but there is no need to cash out now it's only going to get bigger and bigger there's only there's only more there's only going to be more consumers especially when these imagine little tay right that girl that's always screaming about oh she's got more money than you and um she's balling and shit imagine that generation when they grow up what the sneaker what the, what the sneaker culture is going to look like imagine what complex con is going to look like in five years even if it's not complex con anymore even if it's something else right imagine what that level of thing is going to look like a trade show for kids to kind of just go hang out and buy shit at I think it's, it's only going to get bigger and bigger. So to cash out now would be fucking silly because you could cash out in, in a couple of years and you can make absolute bank. And I think 57 million anyway for sneakers and stuff is way, 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 way underpriced. So I was happy to see them clear it up and say basically the news was false. I'll kind of read a bit of the statement now that kind of detailed it. But um, essentially the CEO of sneakers and stuff, Eric Fagolind, said... It said at the following this week various press reported that sns cashed out and sold to a vc for 57 million dollars this is not entirely true so they did cash out in some extent but not 57 million these guys are balling man fuck i wish i opened the store from back in the day um and as and as very few media have reached out to even verify with us which is true right hype is just post stuff they see on social media there's no very there's no journalistic in, uh, integrity with hypebeast for the most part which we don't mind you know hypebeast is sort of like a an exaggerated version of reddit right they just post what's out there right and just kind of gets upvoted in a way they're kind of in that kind of vein now aren't they with the most popular news wherever they list it anyway um i figured it we needed to post this short message to straighten things out i mean we have always been as transparent as possible so why stop now what happened was that the VC partner that we had um, for the past three years was at the end of their term. We looked around for a new partner and found it in, FNC, in FSN Capital. And when that deal was constructed, um, a holding company was set up. The holding company then bought all shares in SNS. And for the money that the holding company paid, myself, Peter, and all the other investors managers of SNS reinvested the majority of it back into the holding company. So we pretty much swapped shares in SNS for shares in SNS holding company. And to be extra super transparent, we did not reinvest all of it, but the majority of it, which is amazing. So we haven't cashed out. We have a new partner that bet that can better that better can support our ambition going forward we have a new store opening in the usa this fall we are looking into how to open these stores in asia in 2019 and we have a bar opening in new york this fall as well and a club in berlin sick man awesome i hope i can play in that club soon book me motherfuckers um for us this is important to have a right partner we can support our vision long term the rumor about 57 million dollars comes from the evaluation that fsn had made of, of sns in order to replace our former vc partners between everyone involved we have agreed not to publish the evaluation but i can tell you that the 57 million dollars is not correct so they got paid but not 57 million paid this is a number someone made up it would be it would, it would be it would i would like to point out that 57 million dollars is now used as a headline and clickbait what happens now then well there are a few raffles next week a few launches this week and more to come for the show management and all teams in, um remain the same me and peter and our 200 people deep sns family will still be running sns and there are still many years left for, on our journey and we're still excited to be here thank you that's amazing happy day in cashing out stay strong guys um don't cash out just yet you, you know what i mean like no no don't do that just yet i like sns i think the store's great they got a good online store the raffles they do are pretty solid and i'm looking forward to seeing what they're gonna do it's sort of like they're gonna they're kind of going in the, in the same vein as kimfolk right 
opening up a bar, a nightclub. That's going to be fucking amazing, isn't it? Sneakers and stuff, right? Hopefully, they, they can't call it sneakers and stuff bar, though, isn't it? That's fucking gay. I, I kind of never like the, the name, i got to be honest. It's sort of like slamming kicks. So like, ugh. It kind of, it, it's really um, pre-2010 name, isn't it, right? The name of it, like, Slamming Kicks, Soul Box. It's like, oh, we get it, man. It's like calling your shop uh, BNIB, isn't it? Brand new in box. It's like, oh, Jesus Christ. But hey, what can you do? I'm happy they're not selling. The valuation probably not as high as it should be, but good everyone's hanging around and no one kind of got kicked out of their jobs. Amazing. And I think that might be it. Oh, one last thing. Kids See Ghosts with Kanye West and Kid Cudi is coming out very, very soon. And... Um, Murakami designed the cover and he's released it now and everyone's freaking out because it's not square which is funny and it? it's not 1080 by 1080 so <laughs> it's interesting to see how that lays out on our iTunes or in general on Spotify and stuff but yeah the cover looks fucking amazing can't wait for that album to come out um, there's been a lot of people who weren't that happy with the Ye, the Yay album or the Kanye album so hopefully this might tickle people's fancy a little bit more and I'm a big fan of Kid Cudi's melodies anyway I'm a fucking huge Kid Cudi fan very instrumental in my life and how I kind of looked at music since Man in the Mood and all that malarkey so that's going to be very interesting to see when that drops tomorrow and you know I might do a listening party on Twitch actually playing this music out loud but I don't know if they let you do that on Twitch is it? maybe they might not let you do it but I'll try and do it anyway on Twitch uh, tomorrow via the stream we've got that wave app in it that they're streaming everything on but yeah that might be it for now concluding the episode number 75 of the Accident Zinger show with news of Kid Cudi and Kanye West as ever because that's what we want to do here you know we want to be those kind of guys thank you again for tuning in I'm doing two a week now I'm going to fucking pack it in, pack it in. And I'm making clips on YouTube. So check that out. All the links will be in the description. You can subscribe to my YouTube podcast in the description. If you listen to it via audio, you can also check out the clips on the YouTube. Like, subscribe, share, all that fucking malarkey. Episode number 75 of the Agassino Zinger Show. Thank you for tuning in and hanging around and just, you know, just chilling with the kid, man. It's a good day. Today, I'm going to go to a gallery event. Actually, I'm going to go see work by Urus Fisher at the Sadie Coles Gallery. They're doing a little private view this first. Thursday, so um, that should be good. Some free wine and beer. Bang, 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 gang. So, yeah, see you again very soon. Thank you for checking me out. For all information regarding my DJ gigs, check out accentzinger.com. I'm playing at the Heathcote Star very, very soon. You can check out all my DJ listings there and all that malarkey. This has been the Agostino Zinger Show, episode number 75, and I'm out. Peace.